Today's video is sponsored by Holzken, who are celebrating their seventh birthday this year. They're a brand that's been spreading love for wood since 2016. Over the years, Holzken's young and talented team have grown paying great attention to detail and becoming a leading brand for wooden watches and natural jewelry in Europe. And now they ship personal pieces of nature from beautiful Vienna to all corners of the globe. With over a million happy customers and 10 Holzken stores in Austria and Germany, they've built a strong bond with their community. And what sets Holzken apart? Well, they've stayed true to their motto, naturally unique, uniquely natural. Even after after creating over 800 designs, their watches and jewelry are still made with natural materials like wood, stone, mother of pearl, and each piece has its own distinct grain or marbling. You can see this one, there is the wood in the strap, which is very, very nice. But it doesn't stop there. Holzken believe in giving back to nature too. They prioritize sustainable production, packaging, and delivery routes. Plus, they partner with organizations like the Jane Goodall Institute to support reforestation and other environmental and social projects. Look, in today's world, we're bombarded with information and pressure. It can be a bit overwhelming, and that's why Holzken's products aren't just great timekeepers and accessories. They serve as a personal reminder of nature. It's always there on your wrist with the wood. And aside from being beautifully crafted, they can make a great gift for someone special. Here's the best part. I've got an exclusive discount code just for you. If you use the code SHADOWS15 during checkout, you'll get 15% off, which is fantastic. Make sure you check out the link in the description below to explore Holzkern's incredible collection. Don't forget to use the discount code SHADOWS15 to get that 15% off. And now today's video. It was a decades-long war of the shadow hands. A global struggle for dominance decided by proxy conflicts, military-industrial sprinting matches, and most of all, information. For the vast majority of the Cold War, intelligence was the ultimate weapon. On the enemy, on their plans, on their allies, and most importantly, on the innumerable points of weakness that could be pushed and prodded until one side finally had enough. The American CIA, the Soviet KGB, spent some 50 years as dueling puppet masters in which alliances, informants, and information were an unbelievably valuable commodity. Nowhere around the world was that dangerous game more unpredictable than in Africa. Between countless coups, uprisings, and changes of national leadership, and the many stateless nations, armed resistances, tribal groups, and warlords that controlled their own small pockets of the continent. As a result, the Eastern and Western intelligence apparatuses working across Africa had to be just as nimble, just as adaptive, simply just to keep the peace. But by the 1970s, congressional efforts to curtail the powers of the CIA meant that the Western networks in Africa needed to be rethought in order to avoid losing the continent completely to Soviet influence. The answer was the Safari Club, a covert alliance of intelligence networks that became Africa's most powerful anti-communist player. It's their overthrow of nations, their fermentation and suppression of unrest, and their lasting impact on the African continent that we're going to dive into today. The Central Intelligence Agency was created in 1947 by order of United States Congress in a post-war world that saw little reason to restrict its intelligence bodies in advance of the Cold War. During a mad dash to shore up alliances and collect intel ahead of an inevitable era of hostility, the CIA was essentially given carte blanche to do what was necessary on foreign soil with pretty minimal restrictions and no real meaningful oversight from the federal government. This took on a variety of forms during the early years of the Cold War, overthrowing the democratically elected government of Guatemala, trying to kill Fidel Castro about 12 times a week, developing advanced technologies like the U-2 spy plane, and generally doing just all manner of cool and pretty questionable spy sh**. But the CIA situation changed in the early 1970s when its operatives participated in a political break-in that would later be known as the Watergate scandal. As it turns out, the federal governments of the United States were not the right people to piss off, and they responded to the scandal with a series of investigations into the CIA's activities. This was made worse shortly afterward when the New York Times reporter Seymour Hersh publicly exposed a years-long CIA campaign that included the interception of private mail on U.S. soil. These twin scandals opens the floodgates to a series of groundbreaking reports on CIA activity, including assassinations, experimentations with psychotropic drugs, and creating secret spy planes that were not disclosed to the public. In response to the revelations, President Gerald Ford 
brought the house down on the CIA. On January the 4th, 1975, he signed into law Executive Order 11828, uh, which would establish a special commission to restrict the CIA's activities. The House and the Senate would each establish their own select committees in the following weeks. Although the intent and action of each oversight group was slightly different, they all had the same effect. The CIA no longer had free reign in securing American interests around the world, and they no longer had a blank check to use American dollars to do it. We'd have to guess that this wasn't particularly popular within the CIA itself, but American intelligence wasn't the only organization that was left out in the cold. The CIA's international network of allies, nations like France, the UK, Israel, and Iran, all had their own global intelligence networks, all of which have been operating contingent on the CIA's formal and informal leadership. When the US government shackled the CIA, its allies were left to figure out how to fill in an unexpected void all across the world. This posed problems in just about every developing area around the world. But in Africa especially, the change couldn't come at a worse time. The collapse of the Estado Novo state in Portugal, which we've also covered in a video on this channel, by the way, if you're interested, led to the collapse of the Portuguese imperial holdings in Africa. Mozambique and Angola had been thrown into a revolution, posing a legitimate threat to regional power players like South Africa and Zaire. By this point in the Cold War, it had been well established that where revolutions spread, the CIA and KGB followed close behind. And in Africa, the KGB uh, was really holding up their end of the bargain. Marxist ideologues, various rogue actors within Africa and liberation groups like the African National Congress could all have very easily taken charge within those conflicts. And uh, with the CIA hamstrung, there was little they could do to keep those nations from falling completely under Soviet sway. The answer came from a Frenchman named Alexandre de Morichet. He had cut his teeth during the French battles against the Nazis in Algeria before being named head of the Sadizzi, France's intelligence service at that time. De Morichet was a highly influential figure within France and had attempted to raise attention toward Portugal's former colonies in Africa as early as 1974. With little support from France's president at the time for any sort of large-scale operations there, de Morichet instead chose to reach outward and attempted to foster an international intelligence network in Africa with the CIA's direct involvement. In his coalition, de Morichet invited five other nations, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Morocco, Iran, and Algeria. Although Algeria declined to participate, the other four invitees expressed their interest in what de Morichet had to offer. In 1976, the intelligence leaders of five participatory nations in de Morichet's network met at an exclusive resort in Kenya known as the Mount Kenya Safari Club. The club was owned and operated by Adnan Khashoggi, an enormously influential Saudi arms dealer and Incidentally, if you recognize that name, yeah, that dude's the uncle of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, who would be assassinated by the Saudi government in 2018. At Khashoggi's resort, the five participating intelligence agencies would sign a charter, vowing mutually interrelated support in conducting their mission on the African continent. According to the document, their chief concern was Africa's potential to be a theater of communist revolution under the direct or indirect organization of the Soviet Union. Their role, in response, was to support anti-communist movements across Africa with the intent to exert their influence globally to accomplish that mission. Cairo would host the so-called Safari Club's headquarters and their operations would begin as soon as were feasible. At the Safari Club's headquarters, operatives were split into two main divisions, a planning wing and an operations wing, both overseen by a general secretariat. In addition to de Morichet, the operation was overseen by Director Kamal Adam of Saudi Arabia, General Kamal Hassan Ali of Egypt, General Ahmed Dlimi of Morocco, and General Nematola Nassassiri of Iran, all with their own personnel dispatched to join the effort. Around the same time, a financial organization called the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, or BCCI, consolidated operations in Luxembourg. Just like every other intelligence network before and since, the Safari network understood that money always leaves a trail, and the BCCI was the major tool to do just that. BCCI oversaw a vast clandestine money laundering and banking operation, one that sought out the business of everyone from terrorists to warlords to fugitives to communist spies, and formed a one-way tunnel for their secrets to travel directly to the Safari Club. But BCCI didn't just cater to the Safari Club's enemies. Another one of its account holders uh, was the then director of the CIA, one George H.W. Bush. 
It's one of many routes the Safari Club used to backchannel what it could with the CIA, who could try their best to offer limited forms of support despite being unable to send personnel, money, or official intelligence briefs. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger is known to have direct knowledge of the Safari Club and worked to ensure that the group wouldn't be obstructed while achieving objectives that were in U.S. interests. Several high-ranking members of the CIA, including H.W. Bush's successor, would keep informal connections with the Safari Club as well. But during all of this, it is important to note that anything the Safari Club did, they had to plan, fund, and carry out themselves. Each participating nation assumed a subset of responsibility for the overall mission. France supplied a repository of high-tech equipment, Egypt and Morocco brought personnel and weaponry, and Saudi Arabia brought its considerable checkbook as well as connections with non-state actors like Adnan Khashoggi. Importantly, these networks reinforced the diplomatic and trade agreements that these countries already had. For example, Saudi Arabia had already been buying up high-tech French Mirage fighters for Egypt and sending money to Morocco. By pushing new money, personnel, or technology through pre-existing trade networks, all countries involved were able to avoid scrutiny and save considerable time and tedium. The Zavari Club's first taste of action came in the early months of 1977, during a period of unrest in Zaire's Shaba province. In this conflict, an ethnic rebel group had attempted to invade the province, but met strong resistance from the anti-communist government there. The conflict was, in effect, a front for the Angolan civil war, as well as a chance for the Safari Club to protect valuable mines within the Congo. The conflict was marked by a notable ineptitude on the part of the Zairean government, which had kept its military intentionally disorganized in order to reduce the threat of coup attempts against the president at the time, Sese Mobutu. This choice led to a fairly impressive level of military failure on Zaire's part, but troops from Morocco and Egypt, airlifted via French craft, were able to turn the tide. Convenience. Months later, Safari Club couriers and mediators would broker unprecedented cooperation between Egypt and Israel, which had been an under-the-table ally for the Safari Club given its alignment with generally Western interests in Africa. Intelligence gathered from the Safari Club's networks was instrumental in building trust between both sides, and the group's allies within the CIA quickly moved to reinforce their support for Israel through the Safari Club after the CIA had to outwardly distance themselves from Mossad. The Safari Club's actions led to the Camp David Accords in 1978 and, and a brokered peace between Israel and Egypt a year later. But it was in the Horn of Africa that the Safari Club would have its most classically Cold War-ish undertaking, where they would form one half of the forces that turned 1977's Ogaden War, also known as the ACO somali War, into a proxy conflict. Waged between an invasion force from Somali and Ethiopian defenders in the ethnically Somali Ogaden Desert region, the war was, in many ways, a backwater conflict. Realistically, it should have very little impact outside the two very poor countries on either side, especially given that it was fought over a barren desert with little consequence other than for the tribes that lived there. But the Soviet Union and the United States had already been fighting for influence in Ethiopia, with the Soviets getting the upper hand after a coup in 1974 and uh, making clear the designs for a communist federation that would combine the Ethiopian and Somali states. With the outbreak of violence in the Ogaden, Somalia's socialist leadership reached out to the United States for support, with the Soviets pivoting squarely behind Ethiopia. But at this time, the United States restrictions on CIA activity were still in place, with the Carter administration divided on whether to intervene militarily. The Soviet Union had no such qualms, and through over a thousand military advisors, some 15,000 Cuban, Yemeni, and East German soldiers, and a billion dollars worth of weaponry, including advanced aircraft, into the Ethiopian defense. Somalia's invasion force had been numerically inferior from the start, and although it was well-trained and well-equipped compared to Ethiopia, it wasn't enough to stand up to such a large international force. No American support came in response, largely because without the option to leverage the CIA, the US's only remaining option was to send in troops to support what appeared to be a war of Somali aggression. Without support, Somali forces were encircled, gunned down, and routed from the Ogden region shortly after the Soviets' arrival. Now, to this point, the Safari Club hadn't entered the conflict in any meaningful way, but with all this Soviet power in the region and a significantly diminished Somali defense force, the specter of a retaliatory invasion of Somalia was too much to stomach. After all, a Somali defeat after their own invasion simply meant that the regional status quo hadn't changed. But if the Soviets took Somalia as well, the African Horn would probably be lost entirely. It was here that the Safari Club chose to intervene, conveying a specific and clear set of supportive measures and messages from the West. 
Saudi Arabia and Iran worked together to provide tanks and other weaponry to replace what Somalia had lost in the Ogaden and, and back channeled communications between the United States and Somali leadership, mostly for the Carter administration, to covertly scold the Somalis for jeopardizing their own positions with a war that the US could not support. Although this support came about after the official end of hostilities in Somalia, it had two major effects for the future. Firstly, the Safari Club provided Somalia crucial material support in resisting a counter-invasion of Ethiopia, which by that point was well equipped to run through what remained of the Somali military. The presence of more significant military hardware effectively deterred a Soviet counterattack. Secondly, the Safari Club were instrumental in facilitating long-term military involvement between the US and Somalia, leading to a significant US physical and monetary presence in the country uh, moving forward. Without the Safari Club filling the role of the CIA, these channels and communications might have never been established, essentially ceding the African horn to the Soviet Union. This sort of support epitomized the Safari Club's modus operandi, to use its financial and diplomatic regional influence to bring the West back into contact with potential allies in Africa, mainly via the links established by the BCCI financial organization. The BCCI would also be critical to facilitating mutual US and Saudi support of Afghanistan's Mujahideen during the Soviet Union's intervention there, with the Safari Club's infrastructure forming the integral link between all of the players. But as effective as the Safari Club was, it was also a relatively short-lived organization. The Iranian Revolution began just two years after the Safari Club was established, and by its end, it would remove Iran from the mix entirely. It's important to note that we likely don't know the full scope of the Safari Club's actions during this time, especially as they may have been related to unrest in Angola and Mozambique. Because of the loss of Iran as a major source of funds and material, the club's work in Zaire, Somalia, and the Israeli-Egyptian peace talks would be the functional extent of its known impact. But although the Safari Club was gone almost as soon as it was created, its legacy and impact would shape the rest of the Cold War in Africa. The club's intelligence links between France, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Morocco, Israel, and the United States would continue to be leveraged throughout the 1980s in the Iran-Contra affair, the continued Mujahideen resistance in Afghanistan, and in the many smaller affairs of Africa during that time, from Chad to Tunisia to Zimbabwe to Uganda. The BCCI would continue to grow rapidly during the early 1980s with a complicated and highly secretive leadership style that belied the geopolitical importance and the legal dodginess of the business it dealt around the world. Ultimately a stateless bank despite its charter being held in Luxembourg, the BCCI continued to garner skeptical looks from law enforcement and intelligence agencies until an audit by the bank's accountant Price Waterhouse uncovered fraud on a massive scale. Knowing what we know about BCCI's purpose being to facilitate financial intelligence gathering on enemies of the West, it should be no surprise to reveal that the bank had laundered money for people like Iraq Saddam Hussein, Panama's Miguel Noriega, and Pablo Escobar's Medellin cartel, as well as the CIA, Jimmy Carter, and the National Security Council. However, those revelations did not go over well with, well, most of the developed world, and a series of investigations and reports led to the BCCI's eventual forced liquidation in 1991. Litigation over the former bank's dealings would continue for decades. As for the Safari Club itself, its existence was revealed after the Iranian Revolution, when the Islamic Republic of Iran allowed Egyptian journalist Mohammed Haikal to go through what remained of the former Shah's archives. Among what he found was a copy of the charter that founded the Safari Club, which he brought to the world's attention shortly afterward. The club's French leader, Alexandre de Montrachet, would resign from his post in 1981 and author a number of books prior to his death, including a co-authored book predicting a coming of age of terrorism-based warfare, which came out about a decade prior to 9-11. From Saudi Arabia, intelligence director Kamal Adam and Adnan Khashoggi uh, would co-found business ventures together, and subsequently Adam would be brought down in a series of investigations around the BCCI. Khashoggi would serve a prison sentence in the 1980s and a long list of scandals which would reduce him to just a shadow of his former arms-dealing glory. From Iran, intelligence director Nematollah Nasiri would be executed following the Iranian Revolution, while Morocco's Ahmed Limi would die in a car crash in 1983 that many believe was an assassination. Only Egypt's head delegate from the Safari Club, Kamar Hassan Ali, would get away scot-free, rising to the office of Prime Minister of Egypt before his death in 1993. No core member of the Safari Club survives today, and both Africa and the wider world have transformed since the group dissolved. 
But for what little time it existed, this clandestine network left an indelible mark on Africa and the institutions, diplomatic ties, and intelligence networks that it created would last for decades.